Hello, Temple Guards are the secret servants of the Jedi Order. Their mandate was to protect their brothers and sisters inside the Jedi Temple. What if Anakin Skywalker became a Jedi Temple Guard? Would being a Temple Guard change his mindset? Would he sever all of his attachments? Or would he see it as another ploy by the Jedi? Special thanks to Art Tins for sponsoring our 75,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. All the details are in the pinned comment down below. Our story begins inside the Jedi Temple. Anakin was 17, and he was still undergoing training with Obi-Wan Kenobi. His training had been successful up until this point. Anakin originally had no interest in the Jedi, but after a few months of training inside the youngling section of the Jedi Temple, he felt called to be loyal to the cause. Anakin never forgot the day. It was another simple, instructive day. He had obviously up until that point missed his mother and wished to see her, but the lesson he had changed everything for him. Not to be mistaken, the former slave to Wado still wanted to free his mother, but he learned how to sever his attachments to what was no longer present in his life. The quick resolve within Anakin's heart was something no one could have predicted, but just like any other good academy or service, the indoctrination tactics worked to perfection. One could call them indoctrination, while others might call them simply traditionalism. Whichever it might be, Anakin was locked in on that day. The Jedi took their students to the middle of the city of Coruscant to a large plaza. Of course, this plaza was really cool because for Anakin, he got to look up at all the massive skyscrapers around the area in the city. They surrounded the plaza, and inside the plaza, there were all sorts of attractions. Little candy machines, small rides, games where no one could win the prizes, everything anyone could have wanted. It was so quaint. The classes of younglings came here from time to time to visit the only connection the world could have with the planet itself, Mount Umet. It was the only visible remaining piece of Coruscant left on the planet. The Jedi always took their young here to Mount Umet so that they could see the planet and connect with it. This was a long-standing tradition for the Jedi, and when Anakin was brought here for the first time, he felt his purpose call to him. For many Jedi, this helped them become one with themselves, but not just themselves, but the force on the planet the Jedi called home, Coruscant. To feel such serenity and oneness with the force on the planet itself allowed for the Jedi to operate, as they believed, on a higher plane of existence. Of course, ignorance is bliss, and so on and so forth. While Anakin was here, he would have the opportunity to feel the top of the mountain through the Force. All the younglings gathered up, and the section closed off to the public temporarily. Master Keller and Beck set it up so that students could come in, do their meditation, and then leave just in time for the following class to get here. Anakin walked with his class, a little behind his peers, but close enough to them to see the mountain from a distance. As they got closer, he could feel the immense energy radiating off of the massive structure. Anakin walked behind his class and sat down behind everyone. At this point, he was still a bit antisocial to his peers, and he didn't get along with anyone aside from the little tools and robotics he harbored in his room. He sat down and reluctantly followed the instructions, feeling through the force, and he felt a massive pull. Anakin's head jolted back, and he was sent down in a vision. Anakin felt a shock, and in his mind, he was taken down. He could see the mountain, and he followed a stem of force that flowed through the mountain. It crawled down the spine of the planet, and the system tangled itself down to the surface of the planet, completely dark. A light existed, and a dark existed, but in between was the balance. Yes, yes, the basic instructions of the Jedi, but there was something more. Anakin could hear whispers through the Force, and he could see shadows dancing around in the darkness. In his mind, he called out, and he was approached by a faceless apparition. But there wasn't just one, there was multiple. They spoke to him in riddles. It was like Master Yoda, but in its own way more unique and more powerful. The voices were the embodiment of the Force, and Anakin could feel it, yet he didn't understand it. He looked around, and they surrounded him, telling him to embody what it was he was afraid of. Another one of them chanting, that the most growth happens when he is least comfortable. A third voice told him that all he wanted was within his grasps, if he only let go of what he feared to lose. The fourth voice told him the Force was his ally. He connected to the Force greater than many mortals. He should take it with great responsibility. The final voice showed up in front of Anakin, and a face was revealed. It shocked Anakin, and he fell backwards. The voice told Anakin that he needed to stop fearing what hadn't happened. He was the only one who could bring balance and disrupt it. His resistance has dulled his abilities, and if he accepted that resistance was a part of the journey, he could refine and sharpen himself into who he wanted to become. The voices spun around in circles, around and around, and Anakin was shown a vision. A vision of two different versions of himself. One variation showing a shadow he saw on Tatooine, following him around, and the other variation a freed, liberated man with the potential for anything he dreamed of. The vision was very difficult to follow for Anakin because it was confusion, but the point that he understood is that he should stop resisting the lessons that he was taught inside 
inside the Jedi Order. When Anakin came from the vision, he was confused. His peers were gone, and the city was ripped in half. His eyes twisted towards the mountain, and in front of him, it too was split. On the left side of the mountain was light and shining, and on the right was darkness. The city on the right was shredded, torn to pieces and flaming. People could be heard in the distances crying out, and to the left, the complete opposite. This wasn't real, was it? It couldn't be. Anakin's head spun and the voices returned, repeating their phrases, and Anakin jolted to his feet. None of his peers moved. They kept focus on the meditation. The instructor of the class, who had absolutely no interest in Anakin, didn't pay him any mind. She always believed that he was simply being disruptive to be disruptive. Kelleran, on the other hand, noticed this and pushed the little pod next to him over to where Anakin was. Grogu was in the pod. He talked to Anakin about his vision and what he had seen. Kelleran noticed how wild Skywalker's vision was and how it was treating him. He could see Anakin moving back and forth like he was trying to get something out of his head while he was meditating. Anakin was unsure of how to approach this Jedi Master, but Kelleran made it easier for him. Skywalker and Master Beck talked for a little bit. Anakin didn't reveal anything of the vision but expressed some of the things that he saw, small details that wouldn't make Kelleran fear him or want to suppress him. But there was no worry. Master Beck wasn't that type of Jedi. He was simply just trying to assist a confused student. That was his job as a Jedi Master. When the rest of Anakin's peers were done, they went back to the temple to carry on their lessons. For Anakin, he took the vision with much more precaution. Seeing the end results of the darkness and what it made him fear was the idea of turning to it, especially considering there was a memory shown to him of that shadow creature that followed him around on Tatooine when he was still there. Anakin, for the rest of his training, wouldn't just bend over backwards for the way of the Jedi, but he would stop being such a hassle for everyone. He would accept his teachings, he would listen to instructions, and he would stop being an irritant. This would in turn work out for him as he began garnering friends because he wasn't such a hostile force. This did aid him elsewhere aside from his basic training. It helped Anakin become more powerful than he could have otherwise. It wasn't the Jedi training, but it was more so the fact that he was no longer resisting. He was accepting and he wasn't trying to be rebellious at every turn, which when he was passed over from youngling training to Obi-Wan Kenobi, he was able to continue his exceptional growth. Because Anakin was no longer being petulant, Obi-Wan didn't struggle as much as he would have otherwise. Anakin's resistance to the teachings and disdain for listening would have stammered his growth, and he now had a potential for something more than he could have ever achieved before. After he started training with Obi-Wan, he was allowed on one mission with the Chancellor, per the Chancellor's request, but when Anakin came back, he requested that Obi-Wan please not allow that man to go anywhere near him again. Anakin being so intertwined with the Jedi for the past three years felt nothing for the call of what Palpatine was suggesting. There was a genuine internal change within Anakin Skywalker before this interaction, technically the second meeting with Palpatine. He learned to let go and because of his maturity and his shown ability to effectively and maturely communicate with his instructor he was able to ask for his mother to be freed. Because no one ever brought it up, no one really knew that his mother was still enslaved. Obi-Wan kind of forgot about it because he was never on the ground on Tatooine and the council wasn't really ever informed of slavery in the Outer Rim. The discussions never came to their doorstep, so with a calm demeanor, an Anakin who now accepted the ways of the Jedi told them about it and they were much more inclined to treat his questions more seriously. Because many didn't know about slavery in the Outer Rim, the question was brought back to the Jedi Council chambers along with Anakin Skywalker himself. The council was waiting his arrival and when he arrived, they were genuinely surprised by the growth he'd shown since his arrival. Only a couple months after his time at Mount Umet, he had changed so much. Of course, the council members didn't really know that. Anakin's poised demeanor and ability to speak confidently with maturity and integrity helped them take his concerns legitimately. And while it was obvious that Anakin was asking on behalf of his mother, there was also the fact that he was asking on behalf of every slave in the Outer Rim. The Council could handle his request adequately because of Anakin's calm resolve towards it. To the Council, they weren't entirely sure if he had renounced his attachments, but the work he had done thus far was worthy of praise. The Council told Anakin that they would look into it because it would be of the utmost importance importance for them to keep the galaxy pure from slavery. Anakin appreciated the council's understanding. He may have been a young boy at this point, but the fact that ever since he began working in the ways of the Jedi and trusting their lessons that they taught, instead of just simply trying to resist every little thing they did, he was rewarded. He was treated as one of them, not as an outcast by instructors and peers alike. It was really incredible for him, and he couldn't be happier with how this had actually turned out for him. It seemed like the vision at Mount Umet was correct. Each time he went back on the corresponding months and years, he never had a vision quite like 
like the one he had before, but it didn't deter him from his path. The way Anakin perceived at this point is that he was on the current path set forward by the vision, and so each time he reconnected with the planet, he was being guided forward one more step at a time, each new step allowing him to uncover something new about the Force and himself. Anakin learned over the years, from when he was a boy with the younglings to a young man with Obi-Wan, that it wasn't just about the finish line, it was about the journey. Anakin's perspective on the Jedi would be jolted when he was informed by Master Windu and Master Kiari Mundi that Shmi Skywalker was freed from Watto, however there were some issues unfolding. Anakin would come to learn, as many other Jedi did, that the slavers in the Outer Rim didn't take too kindly to this. As it was reported by the Jedi to the Galactic Republic, Palpatine began crushing the Outer Rim crime lords with tariffs and taxes, blocking trade routes and hyperspace lanes, and setting up blockades outside their empires. This was bad for the Jedi, especially being that Palpatine was a Sith Lord, but he knew how to play a popular politician. Though this didn't make Anakin feel any particular way about Palpatine, aside from, oh, he's finally doing his job. Anakin was an Outer Rim kid. Why in the Force would he trust a man who ruled the galaxy as Supreme Chancellor but didn't get rid of slavery in the Outer Rim? The only reason Palpatine was aware of it is because of Anakin and the Jedi. Anakin was much more thankful to the Jedi and their quick response to his request rather than Palpatine's. The trust was established and it only continued from there. After Anakin became Obi-Wan's student, he began to find interest in becoming a temple guard. Kenobi was a little surprised by this, but if it's what Anakin wanted, then he would do his best to help him reach such a level in his training. Obi-Wan, shortly after Anakin admitted his desires, went to the Jedi Battle Master Syndralic and informed him of Anakin's interest in becoming a Jedi Temple Guard. Syndralic knew why Anakin was interested in such a thing, but he told Obi-Wan that as long as Anakin studied hard, showed no signs of hard attachments, and developed great skill with the blade and with the force, then the chances of him becoming a Temple Guard were extremely likely. Syndralic always kept 500 guards on his unit. 250 of those guards were temporary. It depended on how long a guard wanted to be a part of his unit, but for the most part the 250 temporary guards would join the temple guards right after they became Jedi Knights, so that they could spend an elongated time inside the temple studying and working on their finesse and on protecting those inside the order. Of course, these were very mature students and very reserved, rather than adventurous or other Jedi seeking to leave. The other half of the unit was permanent, full of Jedi Masters and Knights. These Jedi served their entire lives dedicated to the unit and to the code. The permanent members of the Jedi Temple Guard unit were allowed special access to the restricted section regardless if they became a Jedi Master or not. Before Obi-Wan finished his informational session with Syndralic, he asked the Jedi Master why Anakin had such an interest in the guards. Not that Obi-Wan didn't listen, but Anakin never covered a reasoning for it, and by the sounds of Syndralic's response, it seemed like he may have known why. He simply told Obi-Wan that Anakin and his class, one day, on a field trip, were cornered by a group of bounty hunters, or as they called them on level 1010, lightsaber collectors. The younglings teacher was gutted in front of them, and before the younglings too could be killed or be taken away, they were saved by a group of temple guards who were down there. It did sound like it was an unbelievable story to Obi-Wan, but it wasn't the first time this group struck, and the guards were down there to follow the younglings and their class to see if they could catch these lightsaber collectors, and they did. It was a perfect plan and the Jedi were able to knock more criminals off the streets. Obviously, the casualty was not intended, but the teacher did protect the younglings and that's all that mattered, the future of the Jedi. For Anakin, being saved by the temple guards made him realize that they were actually real. He didn't know they existed, he never noticed them before, and who could blame them? They were never active members of the community. They were continuously kept anonymous for their own protection. The mandate placed forward would be secrecy of their identities. For all their friends, it would just be said that they were going on missions, journeys, or into self-isolation until they believed they were ready for their next step in life. Of course, many people never knew this within the Jedi Order, and they just accepted it and had no real reason to refute their peers going on elongated missions. Many Jedi had them, and it was a large galaxy, so why wouldn't their friends have them? Regardless, Anakin's obsession began that day, and he made it clear to Obi-Wan, once they got acquainted with each other, what he was hoping to become in his future. Skywalker as a young man didn't have many limitations, and Obi-Wan was very prideful of a student. To the High Council, Obi-Wan looked like a brilliant instructor, taking on a student that had no previous training inside the Jedi Order and turning him into the pride of the Jedi. Anakin Skywalker was a formidable duelist. As a boy, he dreamed of being the best saber duelist in the Order. As a young man, he put those aspirations to the side, as they were selfish and the Jedi were meant to be selfless. Anakin's inner turmoil dissipated and he had no troubles with much of anything. The largest challenges came from the form of his master's lessons or just their adventures across the galaxy. 
and the sparring arena, Anakin had his struggles against Obi-Wan, but not as many as he would have had otherwise, especially if he hadn't been able to let go of his chains. Anakin with patience and tranquility, alongside of that of the natural talent that even would make Dooku jealous, made him a force to be reckoned with. Obi-Wan would often allow and even request that some of the best duelists in the Order challenge Anakin Skywalker. He used a singular blade most of the time, especially when he was using a lightsaber, but if he was practicing alone, he used a staff, or what they called here inside the Jedi Order, a Joe Staff. The lightsaber was for proficiency, with a singular blade. The Joe Staff for Anakin was more so confidence for when he tried out for the security guard positions. Anakin had, at this point, challenged several of the Masters on the High Council, but he hadn't won any of those fights. Don't be ridiculous, a 17-year-old boy fighting the talents of the High Council? No. But he did get close to winning a few. He almost caught Kiari Mundi slacking in their duel, and he was close to beating Eeth Koth twice. He had much to learn, but because of his reservations and his ability to be proud of himself without arrogance, allowed his style to shine through. He may have used more aggressive styles, but his persona allowed him to develop into something a Yoda or a Plo Koon would use, a gentle powerhouse if you will. Someone who could very easily dispatch a number of duelists alone, but would rather use words. Anakin would develop into that. Every time Anakin sparred with a council member, Remember, it was the event to be at. Mostly masters were allowed to show up, but some Padawans and Knights did. He was amazing. Every strike was flawless as the next. Anakin Skywalker was incredible to say the least. 17 years old and challenging the likes of some of the best the Order had to offer? He had yet challenged Master Yoda, but at some point, that would be his honor. To Anakin, it was honorable as a thing to do. To be able to spar with so many incredible duelists inside the Jedi Order, it was a great joy for him to partake in. He gained nothing from it but experienced. Because of Anakin's duels and spars with other Jedi Masters, it therefore made Obi-Wan a far superior duelist as well, having to prepare himself adequately for each time he faced Skywalker. Because, say for example, if Anakin sparred with Master Ima Gundi, then Anakin would come back to spar with Kenobi and pull an Ima Gundi special, a kickflip aggressive attack. Or if Anakin sparred with someone like Agon Kolar, then his offense would be outstanding. His prowess was impressive at such a young age, and because of it, Skywalker was given permission to become a Jedi Knight. Obi-Wan had trained him everything he could. He only saw brightness for Skywalker's future, and he wanted to allow Anakin to be set on his own journey as long as he was ready. The dynamic between Anakin and Obi-Wan was truly a master and apprentice bond, and it was because Anakin learned how to quell his ego and train his mind to let go. Without that, then all of his development would have been for nothing all of his hard work would have withered away. Skywalker was a true testament to the product of Jedi training, to their code, and the excellence every student strived for. Anakin would gratefully take Obi-Wan's offer, and he would be knighted. This ceremony would have a multitude of council members present, and would prove to Anakin how accepted he was within this order. This was his home, and his family. Because the Jedi Temple was that family for him, he felt the need and desire to serve it as a Jedi Temple guard. Shortly after his knighting ceremony, he would be found by Jedi Master Syndra, the Jedi Battlemaster took Skywalker to a small meditation chamber. It was similar to the Jedi Temple Garden, but much more secluded. The sound in the room didn't carry, and it would only allow them to have an open conversation in a meditative space with other Jedi that couldn't be overheard. This could give Skywalker all the time he needed to make the proper decision for himself. To Syndralic, that was the most integral thing about becoming a Temple Guard. It had to be done by one's own will, and it had to be for their best interest. He wouldn't allow someone to do it if they thought that they would make themselves better, or if he sensed a tiny little bit of selfishness in the action. The purpose of being a temple guard was to be willing to lay down your life in servitude for your fellow brothers and sisters. The Jedi Order was their greatest protection. The test to become a Jedi Temple Guard was ruthless, and for Skywalker, he would have an even more challenging test than any of his other peers, especially peers that joined the unit. There was a reason for this. Syndralic saw Anakin's potential, and he would likely give Anakin a higher ranking position inside the unit, the equivalent to that being a council member on Syndralic's squad. He had commanders, essentially. They weren't literally called that, but they were a higher rank than their peers. Anakin would be the youngest member to ever achieve it if he was able to pass that test. Syndralic told Skywalker that the test would begin in several days. To prepare, he would be fed once a day for the following three days. He'd be permitted two hours of sleep every 12 hours intervals, and so he must choose wisely. 
and lastly, he would be blinded and taken into an unknown facility. This was a common part. To be a guard for the temple, one had to be the best. For Anakin, he was already guaranteed a spot, so why not make him work for a ranked spot in the unit? Anakin was unaware that this was a ranked test, mostly because Syndralic wanted Anakin to go in and give it his best. His belief is that if he told Anakin to strive for a ranked position, it would include a level of selfishness to want to succeed. Now that was unlikely given Anakin's current persona, but he wanted Anakin to only focus on the bare bones of being a Jedi Temple Guard. Lust for more of an influential role wouldn't be a concern for him in this test. Three days would pass. Anakin was taken down into the Undercity of Coruscant. The Temple Guards had a small facility that led straight up to the temple, and it was through this restricted section that the elevator would carry a number of individuals down to the lower levels of Coruscant. It was something newly instated by Syndralic. Once he became the battle master, obviously. When Anakin came to, he was tied to a chair. He was wearing his basic tunic, still in his dark colors as they looked better on him anyways. Anakin looked around. His head was already spinning. The lack of food, the lack of sleep, and the little hydration wasn't helping his consciousness. His eyes focused on the corner of the room. He couldn't see much but a shadow. Anakin looked down at his boots and his arms were tied behind his back. It was a force lock. He couldn't use the force to break free. He needed something else. Looking down at his boots, he was locked in, and the chair couldn't budge. Anakin pondered, raising his head to look at the ceiling and see if there's any way he could find himself out of the building, at the very least get himself out of the chair. His concentration broke when a dozen feet stomped forward. He saw more silhouettes. This was interesting now, wasn't it? He turned his head over his shoulder and then realized he needed to concentrate. His eyes closed and he felt through the living force. None of these guards he recognized. His mind went absent for a moment, feeling through every little itch in the force, seeing where he could find his escape. Anakin's mind ran through his legs down to the floor, feeling his boots slightly lift off the ground. Aha! That's it. Anakin raised his boot and slammed it down as hard as he could. It wasn't much, but it was enough. The jolt of the force shocked the locks off of his feet. A dozen guards ignited their yellow lightsabers. Anakin grinned, using leverage from his legs to leap backwards, and with the momentum of the movement, he removed the locks from his wrists. A charming smile glimmered, and from behind him, a man yelled, cease hostility. Anakin turned around as a strike swung for him. He grabbed the blade and ripped the man to the side, throwing him from his grip. The guard let go in all actuality, but no ordinary man would be able to hold on. Anakin grabbed the training lightsaber and turned to the side. The first three guards moved in. His blade moved between them. Behind him, the words cease hostility rang out again. The rest of the guard moved in. Anakin timed everything perfectly, knocking two of the three out in the first fight and leaping over backwards and landing on the chair he was seated on before, using the force to throw the guards into each other. Four of the twelve still good to fight. Anakin jumped down, quickly moving his blade, his style, his finesse, his swagger. It was intangible. The blade like a blur. Skywalker dispatched his opponents quickly. Syndralic appeared from behind him as a hologram and told him that there were four younglings captured. He needed to find them, and fast. Protect the Order, protect your brothers and sisters. The words echoed out of Syndralic's mouth. Before he even finished the sentence, Skywalker had moved from the door and into the streets. He looked around, trying to regather his senses, feeling through the forest and looking about, seeing if he could feel where the children were, his mind still disoriented for the lack of food, sleep, and water. Anakin knelt to the ground and felt the ground, feeling through the forest for pulses. Jedi typically radiated a larger pulse than normal beings, and while these were younglings, it proved to be effective. Anakin's connection to the planet of Coruscant did not fail him. Skywalker leapt to his feet in a hustle, running through the streets, blasting past people and jumping to the tops of buildings, moving like a torrent in the wind. Skywalker found the place and leapt through the air, using the force to blast a hole in the ceiling of the building before falling into it. He turned around, igniting his lightsaber, and caught wind of pirates. These were the pirates. Of course, this being a training exercise, they had blaster pistols that wouldn't kill him. However, if they stunned him, then his test would be a failure. Skywalker moved out of the way, just in time for one of the stun rounds to miss. He danced to the sides, cutting their pistols into pieces, throwing them over each other. When none of them had a weapon in their hand, his lightsaber deignited and his fist fight began. It may have been funny to imagine several men trying to be one, but he was him, and they were most certainly not him. He was unstoppable, throwing them around without even been using the force. Each land knocked one of them out of the simulation, or knocked more than one out. Skywalker ran through the door before coming face to face with Syndralic. The Jedi Master ignited his lightsaber and told Anakin that if he didn't win this duel, then he would not be welcomed into the Temple Guard unit. Anakin said to himself, looking around, seeing four other Temple Guards standing at attention. When Syndralic ignited his weapon, the other four did as well. Anakin could knock the other four out. 
because if he did, then surely Syndralic would get him. Master Dralic and Skywalker's blades hit each other with a hiss. Anakin moved flawlessly, but Syndralic was a master of all seven forms, and he was prepared for this challenge. Anakin beat around before the first of the four temple guards engaged him. Anakin slid under the strike, making the correct parries and blocks, placing every hit where it needed to be. Anakin took the guard's double-bladed staff and continued his fight. He moved the other three as they engaged with Syndralic, moving around behind them, waiting for his opponent to strike. Anakin engaged the three guards, and when all seemed right, Syndralic landed a perfect strike. It was a disabled strike. In this training simulation, it turned Anakin's dominant right arm into an unusable asset. Anakin put the arm behind his back, simulating that he had lost it. He stumbled back and spun the staff in his hand, his weapon beating at the guards, knocking the first two out, and then stumbling back again. Syndralic was now engaging full time with Anakin, forcing him to defend himself from the battle master himself and a temple guard too, who was extremely talented. Anakin was able to disarm the temple guard, and before he was able to knock him out of the fight, Syndralic landed one more strike, a stomach hit. He told Anakin that this was his final chance to save the younglings. He had one minute to make his final stand. Anakin Anakin nodded his head. His blade spun in his hand, the sound of whooshing echoed out in the chambers. The one temple guard fell back. He watched Skywalker's blade parry and block every move by Syndralic. Something incredible happened though. Despite his shortfalls, Skywalker began an offensive. Syndralic couldn't believe it. Of course Anakin wasn't in a physical pain, but almost only counts in Fathier's shoes and thermal imploders. Skywalker thrust his blade forward, precise with every movement. Syndralic had to keep pace, almost faltering once, twice, almost a third time. Anakin's precision was immeasurable. He was incredible, his patience and his swiftness almost unheard of. But before Anakin could finish Syndralic off, he was killed in the simulation. Anakin fell to his knees and looked back at Syndralic and apologized for his failure. The other temple guards in the room turned their heads to Skywalker and shook them. Syndralic smiled and grabbed Anakin from the ground and lifted him up. He told Skywalker that he passed the basic trial, and he passed the ranked trial too. Anakin was confused, and then it was all explained to him. He told Anakin that any other duelist or individual in such a scenario against him would have broken. Anakin was welcomed into Syndralic's inner circle as a temple guard strategos. It was another word for commander from an ancient Jedi language, and the battle master before Syndralic liked it, and so it stuck. Anakin was shocked, pleased, and surprised. He couldn't believe it. He was doubting himself, wondering how others were able to accomplish this task and make it into the temple guard unit. Syndralic laughed, telling Anakin that most guards do the regular test that he started with. That test typically has only half the opponents, so all the temple guards in the unit had to fight six of their peers, and if they succeeded, then they were welcomed in. This, of course, after three nights of little food, water, and sleep, and being locked in a chair. Anakin did extremely well, and over the course of the next several hours, he'd be outfitted in everything a temple guard needed. New robes would be a beautiful touch to a dull outfit of a Jedi. The temple guard robes were very elegant. Next, Anakin would be sized for his mask, and he would have that made for him. Finally, he'd be given a unique lightsaber for his fighting style preferences, but also one that would be completely unintelligible for recognizing him. Anakin selected a staff weapon simply because it would be better for a fit for him as a temple guard. After that, Anakin would be given a room with the temple guards, in a hallway specified for them. Every guard would be recommended to stay one year as a temple guard before making a decision to stay as one for the rest of their lives or not. For Syndralic, it was a way for him to see which Jedi would fit the role best, but also for Jedi to see if they themselves fit best in the role of Temple Guard. The guard outfit was super awesome to Anakin. He embodied it, and he took it on as it was, wearing it with a true pride and happiness. His patrols around the temple would begin shortly. Because Temple Guards kept themselves secret, no one knew who was who, but Obi-Wan knew which one Anakin was. It was by his stance, the poise, the pride. It wasn't arrogant by any means, but maybe flamboyant would be the better word to use. So Obi-Wan simply told Skywalker that he was proud of him when he passed by. This warmed Anakin's heart. While one would think that life as a temple guard was boring, in reality it wasn't. It was more or less a pathway to being able to be open to literally anything and everything. It was wonderful, and for Skywalker he loved it. Having such a great interest in learning, how could he not rejoice in it? Skywalker's strategist had more access and more permissions than his peers, and to many within the temple, you couldn't tell who was one of these leaders. However, temple guards could tell by a slight insignia on the left shoulder of the strategist. For Anakin, he could move people around and whatnot, he could also visit the restricted section and even change security clearances inside the temple if need be. Anakin instead spent most of his time off duty, reading in the archives and practicing with his peers. Oftentimes he would work on sparring with them, sometimes even challenging some of the council members, which he was getting better with. Obviously, having been sparring with them several times gave him the advantage of numerous encounters against them, but they were still great challenges for him. All the council members knew which one Anakin was, 
not just because of his good fighting style, but because of how good he was. And then of course, they were able to lock onto the insignia, which for Kenobi, as a council member now, it made it easier for him to know which one of the temple guards was his former student. Everything was seemingly alright with the galaxy. Of course, Anakin and his special deployment would be sent down to the lower levels to watch over groups of younglings on field trips, the same way the temple guards had done for him when he was just a boy. The circle was now complete, he was now the protector. He enjoyed this, because these missions or ops or whatever you want to call them, were more movement filled. While Anakin didn't dislike being a guard, standing still all day could be a bit tiresome. He could play games with himself inside of his head, but it didn't deter him from feeling a bit nauseous when his legs locked up. Being down here allowed him to feel a little bit freer, which he enjoyed the exercise anyways. Anakin was always trying to think of ways to improve the way of the temple guards and how they operated, to make their time inside the temple feel more useful, if you will. Being on Syndralic's inner circle, he could suggest some things, but he didn't want to just throw something out. Syndralic was a big time thinker, Anakin needed to deliver something more concrete, something that Syndralic would like. Time would tell. As of right now, Anakin was being dispatched on a mission outside the temple. For whatever reason, the Chancellor believed he'd be safer with a Jedi escort. He requested for Anakin Skywalker, and the Council told him that Skywalker was on a mission elsewhere in the galaxy, but they would deploy a unit of Jedi Temple Guards to oversee his protection. Palpatine initially wasn't fond of this, but when he sensed Skywalker, he was very pleased. He knew based off of Anakin's previous experience with him that their bond wasn't as relatable, so he needed to do something else. There was another two years until the Clone Wars would be started, and he preferred to have Skywalker on his side. No point in ruining such potential with him staying as a Jedi. Skywalker being one of the ranking leaders and one of the best, if not the best in the unit, would be deployed with Palpatine and the other 12 guards. It was a 13 guard operation and Skywalker was in charge of all of it. Palpatine was surprised Anakin went down this path, but he had been planning on it just in case, and he would make sure use of it. Palpatine once realizing Skywalker was in this unit with him, decided to change his plans immediately. Originally, Palpatine was using Skywalker to guard him on a diplomatic mission to Raxus, but with a number of temple guards here and Skywalker, he needed to do something else, and he planned accordingly for it. The Chancellor's vessel would be loaded up, and they would depart for Raxus. Oh no, something must have happened to the hyperdrive. Too perfect of a coincidence. Palpatine thinks not. The ship is brought down onto a peaceful planet, and they land in the forest. And the Temple Guards tell Palpatine that they'll go and grab some assistance and supplies. Anakin planned on leading the task force, and so he did. He left eight of his unit with the Chancellor, while the other four went with him. Skywalker and the other guards would make their way into a small town. At the top of the hill, they could see a massive structure. What an odd sight. Skywalker and the Temple Guards fanned out, looking for assistance. Many people of the public had never seen Temple Guards before. Not that they looked like any band of murderers, but happy thoughts weren't the first thing that came to thought when they laid eyes on the Temple Guards. They'd spend hours out here in the city, unable to find anyone with anything good to fix the oh no hyperdrive is broken. As they walked through the streets, they got a distress call from the guards. They were in a hot pursuit. Three down, the Chancellor was taken. The guards were following some droids back to what appeared to be a castle. Anakin called out and told them to wait for his arrival. Anakin tapped the insignia on his shoulder and met up with his miniature squad before scaling the mountain to get to his comrades. While Anakin's mandate was to protect the Chancellor, his concern was the lives of his fellow men. He couldn't just be allowing them to get injured or hurt or killed. When Anakin eventually got up to them, after a number of hours, he asked on the status on the three guards that were downed. The guard told them that they weren't killed, they were just injured injured with an electric staff. Anakin nodded his head and pulled his lightsaber from his belt. He told them to follow him, and they proceeded with caution. They could not jeopardize this mission or themselves. They entered Castle Sereno quietly. The place was dimly lit. Skywalker told the unit to keep a tight formation. They all abided, keeping closely behind him, in one of their formations. While it would have been easier with 13, they would make it work with 10. Anakin took point. Six guards lined up behind him, three on each side. Behind them was the remaining four, staggered and facing to the sides and behind. One to the left, one to the right, two behind. A simple strategy to ensure all sides were protected, of course. Their feet crept along the sides of the hallways until a door shot open. Anakin held his blade, and they all turned their heads to see an altar in the middle of the room. Blue smoke and steam were emanating off of it. Anakin told the Jedi to keep their distance. This could be dangerous. Electricity rang out as they entered the room, and Anakin was flung forward. From the ceiling dropped down several Magna Guards. The Temple Guards quickly ignited their weapons defending themselves. The Count of Sereno slammed a lock onto Anakin's wrists. This tied Skywalker to the altar. Dooku moved back 
and around the altar and allowed the druids to do their work. The temple guards were not only surprised but outnumbered. There was two magna guards for every temple guard. Their blades all smashed together. The Dark Lord of the Sith floated to the ground effortlessly. These Jedi would die, and Skywalker would be his. Sidious shoved Anakin against the altar, pulling his helmet off and throwing it to the side of the room. Sidious put his hands on Anakin's face, digging his nails into his cheeks and shoving his face into the steam and beginning an ancient Sith ritual. He spoke in a cursed dialect, one so fearsome it shook the other guards to their cores when they heard it. They were all fighting for their lives, but this was enough to throw some of them from their concentration. Skywalker pulled away as blue steam pulled out of his nose. He coughed and his breath felt stale. It felt cold. He could feel darkness washing over him. He couldn't let it. He he pulled back, but Dooku joined in, shoving Anakin's face to the altar. One of the guards saw this. She turned her body, putting her back to her opponents and whipping the lightsaber across the room. Dooku didn't see it coming, and when he heard the sound of the spinning, he looked over, only to be blinded by the strike of the lightsaber. The temple guard was cut down by the Manda guard where she stood, but a battle still carried on around them. There were only five temple guards left and they were outnumbered, but they were able to get together to continue their fight as one. During the battle, the three previously knocked out guards joined the conflict. They helped their brothers and sisters. Anakin could feel Dooku's grip on the back of his head lessen, and with it, he ripped his head back. It broke Sidious from his concentration and the Dark Lord reached forward, his nails grabbing Anakin's skin and pulling it, ripping up his flesh. Anakin looked at the steam and then realized what he should do, leaning back and rushing all of his essence, his body weight, and his power forward, and he shot a blast of the force into the altar, setting off a chain reaction of explosions. Anakin was thrown from his feet, just as Dooku and Sidious were thrown in the opposite directions. Some of the debris cut Anakin's face, and one of the debris pieces lodged itself just above his eye. Anakin pulled the piece out as he looked up, and he saw Dooku rising to his feet and igniting his weapon. He might have been unable to see, but he wasn't going to let Skywalker kill him. Palpatine was furious on the other side of the room. Anakin saw the weapons of the Sith Ignite. He knew he didn't like politicians. Skywalker ignited his own blade, and he drew the attraction of the Magna Guards surrounding his unit. Anakin kept his eyes peeled on the Sith, with the Magna Droids coming for him, and splitting off, he knew what he needed to do. He lunged forward, his blade smacking against Dooku's, jolting him backwards. The Magna Droids jumped in after him. His weapon recoiled off of Dooku's blade and bounced back against the droids, beating one of them and cutting another into a couple pieces, but it still remained operable. Skywalker turned to the flash of light. Sidious was in his face and the shock of the block threw him off balance. Blood from the cut over his eyebrow dripped into his eye and it stung. He closed his eye and block strikes from numerous opponents. He fell back, staggering in his stance. One of the droids blasted him in his stomach with their staffs and he stumbled to his knees, raising his weapons just in time to stop a strike by Sidious. Anakin closed his eyes keeping his patience, holding his tranquility and focusing on the force. His maturity shined in this moment. He shoved back against Sidious's blade, and when the force pushed the Sith Lord back, his feet slided against the pristine floors. Anakin cut the legs off of one of the droids and crushed another. The temple guards were now down to three members, but they had cleared out the magna guards. They rushed forward, coming to Anakin's side, cutting down the other droids that were opposing Anakin. Skywalker was thrown off balance, taking another shot from Sidious that forced the two duelists into one-on-one. -on -one. The other guards moved in on a blind Count Dooku. They believed they had a shot. Each of these guards having seen Dooku in action before he became the Sith Acolyte. Without sight, surely they would be able to best him. Across the room, their strategos staggered, using all of his strength against Palpatine, but the Sith Lord was showing no restraint. Palpatine didn't care anymore. He would break Skywalker. He would make an example of him. It's a shame so much potential was wasted in the Jedi. Sidious's second blade landed true, slashing Anakin's upper collarbone. Nothing damaging to the arteries, but bad enough to hurt a lot. Skywalker fell backwards and looked up into the air, wincing. It couldn't end like this. Anakin could see the faith in his unit and what they used to have. They could see Anakin downed, with a Sith Lord standing over him. Dooku had already killed one of them, and his blade made its final mark against the second to last guard. Anakin looked over with shame. He failed them. It was like slow motion. Sidious turned from Dooku and seeing the pride of his success and moving his attention back to Anakin. Anakin breathed deeply, looking at his final member fall to the ground. Their torso struck. Her audible gasp could be heard, cutting through the sound like a blast of failure. Before Dooku could decapitate her, she slid her lightsaber across the ground towards Anakin, and her head dropped to the ground. Anakin looked at the blade and questioned what her intentions were. Then it clicked. Dooku smiled with a satisfaction with more Jedi deaths under his belt. Anakin saw the smile and the anger didn't pop up, but solidarity didn't. 
He couldn't allow whatever sinister mind this was to go unnoticed. He had to do something. Anakin reached out his arm and dragged the lightsaber from the guard across the ground, igniting it as it pierced the side of Palpatine's knees. The blade went into one side of the left knee and out the far side of the right knee. Palpatine yelled out in pain and fell to his knees. Anakin lunged forward with all of his strength, igniting his blade into Palpatine's chest and ripping to the side. Dooku could feel the sudden disappearance of Palpatine's essence. Dooku moved forward, trusting the force to guide each step. His position was strong, and despite his blindness, he was confident. Anakin got to his feet weakly and held the staff, igniting both sides of it. Dooku chuckled and told the young Jedi that he only sealed his fate. Anakin limped to the side, wavering on his feet. Dooku could feel the weakness in Skywalker's body and jolted forward. Anakin sidestepped in one movement and struck the blade up, cutting Dooku across the shoulder and falling to the ground. He turned around and felt his hip. It was badly cut by Dooku's blade. Anakin pushed the pain to the side, focusing on the force and allowing it to take over. Dooku charged forward, sensing the staff blade that Skywalker was using. Their blades clashed again, and Dooku, using his advanced fighting style to his advantage, blasted Skywalker's blade out of his hands. Skywalker looked around and saw one of his peers' lightsabers on the ground and pulled it into the air, igniting the weapon as it blasted through Dooku's back, killing him instantly. Anakin fell backwards. He heard more footsteps coming. This is what the end seemed to be. He saw a great light, and in front of it, several silhouettes before his eyes rolled back and he was transported to another world. It seemed like the place with the dancing shadows from when he was a boy on Coruscant. The voices asked him questions. Did he embody what he was afraid of? Did his growth happen when he was uncomfortable? Did he let go of what he was afraid to lose? Did he utilize his ally in the Force? Was he able to take his connection to the Force as his responsibility? The final voice showed up in front of Anakin, and a face was revealed. The voice asked Anakin if he stopped fearing what hadn't happened. He was confused. He didn't understand. It was everything they said before, but all now a question. Did he stop resisting? Anakin nodded his head. He felt like a little kid again. Maybe he was? The voices spun around him, telling him that through his answers to the corresponding questions, the Force was granted a unity, a tranquility not seen in generations, a foundation of peace not established since before the Sith. Anakin jolted awake. Where was he? His eyes sealed shut. What happened? He looked around with one eye open, slipping off his bed and a hand jabbed him across the shoulder. Another group of hands pulled him back. Anakin let out a terrible scream, and into the darkness he went again. When he returned, the voices were gone. The dancing shadows had vanished. He looked around. He was at Mount Umet. But instead of a split, there was a balance. There was peace. There was nothing short of happiness. What? Anakin was confused again. What was he experiencing? Did he die? Anakin called out, but not a head turned. The plaza was packed with people, but none of them noticed him when he called out to them. Anakin looked up, and the sky brightened, and his eyes shot open. He looked around in a bright room. He wished they could dim the lights, but that didn't seem feasible. Anakin looked to his side, and almost jumped out of his skin. Master Kenobi was sleeping on a chair, and next to him on a chair was Master Yoda. What were they doing here? Anakin moved his hand up towards his face, his eye no longer sealed shut. He rubbed his finger down a thick line across his face. A scar. Yoda's soft voice jolted Anakin from his concentration on the new scar. He looked over and asked what had happened. Yoda smiled and Obi-Wan woke up with a shock. He looked at Anakin asking if he was alright. He was. They would have a lot to discuss, but for now, they wanted to be here for why Anakin woke up. He would be discharged in a matter of hours. The three Jedi would talk about what happened. When Anakin tapped the insignia on his outfit, it signaled Syndralic. It was built for that purpose. Syndralic and a number of guards arrived just as Anakin was passing out. Something terrible happened. But Anakin, having been the sole survivor, was clearly the work of the Force. He was the chosen one and the Force was in his corner. They explained that once it was revealed that Dooku and Palpatine were Sith, the information was immediately brought to the proper authority and it was determined that the two were co conspiring For what? That was kind of unknown for a while, until it was revealed that Dooku was building a coalition of corporations to rage war on the galaxy. This came out because of new Gunray. He got fidgety. How could he not? Palpatine could no longer protect him in the courts and so naturally he tried to save his own skin by telling Dooku's side of the plot to try and save himself. The records in Castle Sereno would disclose a lot more, the location of Chancellor Valorum's aide, Silman, and where the death of Master Sifo-Dyas was. Not to mention the construction of a clone army in Kamino, it was a lot, but Anakin was also in a medically induced coma for three months, so of course it'd be a lot. Anakin was able to maneuver well, but he was just stiff as a board. His legs were tight and his arms straight up and down. That's what happens when you don't move for three months. Regardless, Syndralic wanted to thank Anakin for his sacrifices. Anakin would be very proud of his work and remain a temple guard for another two years. 
During those two years, Obi-Wan would take on Ahsoka as his own student. By the time Anakin was done being a temple guard, he was hailed by the council. Obi-Wan had left the Jedi Order, and Ahsoka needed a teacher. What happened? Turns out on a mission to Mandalore, of course it was Mandalore, Ahsoka and Obi-Wan were defeating a group of revolutionists called Death Watch, which led Obi-Wan to winning the Darksaber from their leader. But that obviously wasn't the whole story. His dearly beloved finally said the word, and he left the Order, which left Skywalker with the choice to take on Ahsoka or not. Why wouldn't he? She was up the speed on everything and after a year with Kenobi, she was a little bit more than calm. Anakin wouldn't ever return to the ranks of the Temple Guards, but when he was finished training Ahsoka, Master Syndralic would request that he begin his own variation of the Academy for the Temple Guards. Having been the man to defeat the Sith and save the galaxy from an apparent war, he was a hero of not just the Order, but the Republic. Skywalker's Elite Academy for Temple Guards would be constructed on level 1010, and it would be the beginning of the most elite training program the Jedi had ever seen. Anakin didn't even teach in it. He simply just set it up and gave it a curriculum. With so many younglings inspired by Anakin, Syndralic had to enlarge the size of the Temple Guard unit to 1000. By the time Skywalker was a master on the High Council, he had himself a second student, while Ahsoka was taking on her first Padawan. Over the years, Skywalker would be offered the role of Battlemaster of the Jedi Temple, Master of the Order, and even the rank of Grand Master, but he would deny each of them. He believed that the greatest honor to have was to serve as a member on the High Council. He had all the accolades of being the Jedi who brought balance to the Force. He didn't need to be the leader of the Jedi or have a position of power to feel a sense of value, his peace was at his heart. From time to time, he would visit his mother in Tatooine in an attachment that wouldn't inhibit him. During his youth, his focus on training deterred him from visiting, but as a young man and adult, he spent time with her in a pleasant way, never losing connection to her, but never forfeiting his lessons for attachments and never fearing the inevitable, which is death. Skywalker's resolve of heart would not only bring happiness and purity to himself, but every individual across the galaxy. Galaxy. The lack of the Empire and the lack of Palpatine was exactly what the galaxy needed. Anakin's visits with Kenobi and the Kree's family would be common, and he would find joy in Obi-Wan's happiness, believing that it was what Obi-Wan deserved. Anakin, on the other hand, enjoyed the pleasantries of balance in the Force, and the balance that would remain for generations. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our, well, this is a movie, honestly. Special thanks to Galva Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pim Diddy Bane, Jack Miller, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mad Maddy Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Flynn Vassis, Rex the Wolf, the man with three first names, Dark Saint 46, and Lord Denwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. This story was epic, man. Uh, if you want to support me in other ways, go check out the Patreon. Links are down below. Aside, let's talk about our movie. This is probably the longest video I've done in a while, aside from the full series that comes out every week. Really wanted, I really wanted Anakin to feel like someone that could genuinely feel enchanted by the Jedi. I wanted him to fall in love with the idea of being a Jedi, and that's something I don't think was really ever covered in any of our stories, whether it be if so-and-so trained Anakin, or what if Qui-Gon trained Anakin, something we never covered is Anakin genuinely falling in love with the Jedi Order, instead of like falling in love with Padme or whatever, this story is all about him falling in love with the Order and falling in love with the idea of being a Jedi, more so than he did in canon, obviously. And so, that happens, and I think it's kind of a cool take on Anakin's character and kind of how he would handle being a Jedi. I'm not gonna lie, I think if he had accepted everything and done as those people, which were Force Priestesses, by the way, that you saw in the Clone Wars, these, this, this block in his mind would allow him to progress further than he would have ever in canon, because he's not blocking himself, he's not restraining himself, he's not putting himself down or back or whatnot, and so I think that's where the strength in the story comes from, is that Anakin isn't holding himself back, and I think that was the main point I wanted to get across, is that Anakin, in his own way, yes, the Jedi messed up several times, I'm not going to act like they didn't, but we can't stop acting like Anakin didn't contribute to the problem himself. The main point being that, you know, Anakin does kind of get away with murder. <laughs> he kind of gets a, gets a pass, and I wanted to challenge that in a way, and I always try to challenge characters in a different way, so that we can look at them and analyze them in the context of a story with a little bit of a different perception. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this. If you did, you know what to do. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.